Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. It's good to see you. See, see who logged in today. We have a few more coming. Well, I I thought for a second, I thought, oh, well, um, maybe, maybe I'm taking the morning off because I, <laughs> I didn't show anybody in the waiting room or anything like that. So I was like, oh, well, I guess people are CP, but maybe no one's coming. <laughs> so so I was, I was kind of like, it's okay. I could take the morning off, you know? And then, um, so, yeah, of course. Yeah, so I, but I but no, now we're going to hold you accountable. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely much rather be uh, not taking the morning off and being with you guys. So I'm really glad you all. It's so sweet, <laughs> Yay. It's so good to see everyone. I'm going to give a second for people to log in and then we'll do a glad you're here and other stuff. And Becky, wow, your new look. I didn't even recognize you for, I had to double take. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Becky. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're welcome. It looks so different. Yeah, it's cute. I love it. Really cool. Hi, Leanne. Hey. Good morning. Good How's morning. Your, you all. Okay. Well, um, so we have, well, I'll do, I'm going to do a glad to see you personally. Glad to see you, Sarah and Rolanda and Lisa and Becky and Leanne and Lily and Fadwa. I haven't seen you in ages and Jacqueline. It's great to see all of you here today. Um, well, yeah, I'm excited. So I, I woke up this morning and my, my computer told me that I no longer have PowerPoint. So I had to quickly learn how to do Google Slides. It's, it's like, it's part of, I think, the thing that happens sometimes when you're um, about to do something. So um, I was thinking about how useful it is to have at least a tiny bit of sense of it's all gonna be okay, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I said out loud, you know, I'm just setting the intention that whoever needs to come is going to come and whoever, whatever they need to hear, they're going to hear. And whatever needs to be asked is going to be asked and whatever needs to be said is going to be said. So that's my intention. And um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, let me see if I can do a little share screen. I thought I would do in a second, um, do a share screen and see if I can get my my slides up for you. Um, I thought what I would do is start with some cartoons to warm us up a little bit to the day. And then we could go into this, uh, the content of what we're gonna talk about today. And um, we'll do some meditation before we, right after I do the cartoons, we'll, we'll do some meditation, get grounded, do a glad you're here. And then we'll go into the content a little bit more. But I just thought we need a little time to warm up to having a Zoom first thing in the morning. Um, so welcome to 10 Ways to Overcome Fear, Self-Doubt, and Unworthiness so you can enjoy more pleasure and prosperity. This topic was picked out by the Pleasure and Prosperity Facebook group. And if you're not on that group, I really would love for you to join us on it. Uh, like, love getting the input in the comments. So you, I, um, I'm always asking questions and learning about you on there. So, and getting to know where I can be of service. So let's see, let me do a, down that doesn't work. Hmm. Sorry, I'm looking, I'm learning how to, uh, for some reason, advancing the slides is not something that wants to happen. Okay. I guess I have to click on the slides one at a time then. So can you see this if I do it that way? It's yes. not, not optimal, but okay. So this is just a little good morning slide so that you can't leave this presentation and go. She didn't even say good morning. <laughs> okay, and now this is what, um, whoop. This is what it looks like when we walk around with our, well, let's put this way. Everybody has limiting beliefs that I've ever met, but yeah, I may have a skewed population given that I'm in growth and stuff like that, but most people who come to me want to grow and get mentally healthier and stronger and create cool outcomes for their lives. So anyway, um, this is what it looks like when we 
our, um, I'm sorry about the slides here. I thought, I thought I'd be able to, to uh, advance it on the big slide screen, but anyway. So this is what it looks like when we carry around our beliefs, you know, things like I can't do it, I'm not worthy, I must be perfect, I must not make a mistake, I'm not good enough, nobody loves me. Yeah, those are heavy duty burdens to carry around. So be, if, if you think about, if you wanna let something into your life and you're carrying that around, you could imagine how it'd be hard to really get into that too well, how, how it'd be hard to receive. Um, this, this woman's arms are pointing down to the ground. They're not pointing out to receive, you know? So we want to learn how to release that, or it may be, they might be able to coexist on the side even. And we can still walk around and open ourselves to life. Um, if you have background noise, could you please mute your back? Could you please mute yourself? Thank you. All right. And Geez, I'm gonna make this bigger. Well, okay, so this is what it looks like when a waiter has a self-esteem problem. Thanks again, sir, and don't worry about a tip. 5% is perfect. Yeah. I wish I would get that way. <laughs> anyway. <Yeah. laughs> um, here's what low self-esteem looks like when you journal. Dear diary, sorry to bother you again. All right. Um, and then here's the upside of low self-esteem. One of the ducks is saying, you suck. And the other one is like, I know, right? So the upside of self-esteem is that it takes the sting out of insults. Um, okay. And then with self-esteem, we have a lot of self-comparison going on. So in this case, um, the nun is in line first and being evaluated for heaven by St. Peter, I suppose. And behind the nun is a businessman going, great, just my luck. All right. Um, and then this is kind of what, it can also uh, zap our confidence too, in terms of um, our confidence in others. And so like the donkey is listening to his doctor and the doctor says, it's simple, my nurse blindfolds me. I spin around a few times and then I try to reattach your tail. Okay. And this might be, you know, another positive to uh, when our, uh, when we have fear. So the chicken says, I'd rather have an irrational fear of spiders than an irrational comfort with spiders. On the bottom there is what it looks like with the irrational comfort of spire, spiders. And this one is um, the, th this is how it can affect us during the day when we have limiting beliefs. So it says, well, my dog, my day was going okay, but then I remembered something stupid that I said when I was 14. Um, I really think this was kind of funny. Um, so uh, this one is about, so this, chicken or rooster is presenting to a group of, um, it looks like canines. <laughs> and um, Gerald sensed that more than just his reputation was riding on the success of this presentation. Uh, it can feel like that. We have limiting beliefs, can't it? Um, and then here's, sometimes limiting beliefs can, can affect our ability to fulfill our dreams. So when, chicken saying to the other will I complete my bucket list and the psychic chicken says not yours but somebody's <laughs> um okay oh this is I love this one. that was really dark Pam <laughs> <laughs> I know I apologize to all the vegans in the room um okay so this is like have you ever felt like this when you're going through a coaching group okay so the, le the leader says this is icebreakers in the wild the leader says first question which of us would you most like to eat and <laughs> you get to like oh great okay um let me see all right over here uh whoop sometimes our fears you know we need to pay attention to our fears and what they're of. So the clown is admitting that doctors scare him. <laughs> <laughs> Irony. 
again, with self-doubt, which is another part of our work today, um, it shows how it, it's, a, it's a lot to carry alongside you when you're, or on your back when you're um, reaching your goal. And the little guys are like, maybe it'd be easier if we put this down. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I found some of these last night, so they're still new for me. So I'm laughing at them too. Um, but I love this, this one because I've <laughs> experienced something like this. Um, so they're checking into the hotel and the, the registration desk clerk says, um, also included in this package is a vague sense of you're not being good enough to stay here. <laughs> um, and this guy says, the only problem that I have with my belief system is that I always believe it. And the woman says, yeah, I find it best not to trust everything I think. Okay. And that's a big part of like the work we do here. <laughs> Don't trust everything you think. Um, and this is the effect of life coaching. Um, so the little bird says to the peacock, or the peacock says to the little bird, I was just like you. And then I hired a coach. Now look at me. <laughs> so today you may not know anyone or you may know a few people in this room um, from other things we've done together. But um, I liked this as sort of a metaphor it's kind of like when you come into a, a new group or when you come in to discuss a topic that's sort of emotionally charged possibly for you. Um, it might feel like, you might feel like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna contain myself, kind of like a block of ice. Um, but think about everybody else around you as like a little bitty sunflower, you know, and, or a little bitty daisy. And, you know, as you melt and you share your, self with another it's like you're beginning to water this little daisy and the other person and so the more you melt yourself and open up the more the daisy can come to life so i want you to keep that in mind today and all right let me get off the share screen right oh and appeared when <laughs> i was not looking hi again hey there all right, let's pass around the glad you're here to each other. Oh, and Jasmine yeah. appeared too. If you can do um, an unmute of your video, we're all taking the plunge together just for this glad you're here part. Um, if you're able, if you're not, I understand. Now Lily has a baby and she may be nursing it. So she gets a free pass, even though her baby is my youngest client. Yeah. Right, Lily? You, you show us your baby. Yes, he is. He has... Uh, I can show you him. Uh, we had a we had a big blow up today, so I'm trying to clean myself off. So. Oh, TMI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's so cute. Like, look at that hair. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Uh, he'll be 11 weeks tomorrow. <laughs> Aww, so hair. cute. Lily, I always feel a little self conscious when even if I'm just reading cartoons in front of you because of your your abilities and stand up comedy. She's, she's uh, no, I like like those comics. Those were great. I'm I'm listening. I'm also trying to do things at the same time. I'm yeah, sorry. I know. New mom, <laughs> new mom multitasking syndrome. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. It's cool. We just wanted to see you for a sec. Um so I'm assuming Jacqueline and uh Jasmine can't show for right now. Um I don't know, Jasmine, are you able to show your, your face for a sec? We're all showing ours. Just a little guilt there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> didn't work, didn't work. Um, but yeah, I wish she, she would bet. It's just a good thing that you came. Good job, good job. Um, so yeah, all right, well, let's pass around a little glad you're here. So why don't I start with, what we're gonna do is just, you, you're going to call on a person and say, glad you're here, basically. So let's see. I'm, all, I'm glad all of you are here, but I'll just pass to Anne since she snuck in. Anne, glad you're here. Thank you. Sarah, so glad you're here. Thank you. Becky, glad you're here. Thank you. Lisa, I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Becky. Leanne, I'm glad you're here. 
Thank you, Lisa. Rolanda, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Um, Pam, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Let's see. Um, Lily, I'm glad you're here. Are you able to unmute again? Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm glad you're here. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on with her. I'll put ask to unmute, but it's cool. It's all cool. All right. Um, well, we will go to doing a little bit of a centering exercise so that we're just gradually, you know, welcoming the day. And so let's go ahead and take a moment. If you feel like you want to mute for this, it's fine. Um, go ahead and take a moment. We're going to, it's a brief, just a brief meditation, closing our eyes, feeling your feet on the ground or your, your body against the surface that it's resting on. Begin by taking some nice, slow, deep breaths. And as you breathe, notice where the inhale reaches its peak and when the exhale reaches its bottom. Just following the breath. And as you're sitting here in this moment, in this sweet moment of the morning of a fresh new day, think about some of the things you're grateful for. And then returning your awareness back to your body. Set an intention for this mini workshop about one thing you'd like to make sure to walk away learning. And if it feels right to do so, take full responsibility for making sure that you learn that today. All right, very good. And as you're, as you're in touch with what you want to learn and whether you will take responsibility for learning that today, then simply open your eyes and return your awareness to the room with that intention set and your grateful being here. I'm grateful for each of you coming today, allowing me to teach some stuff that I've been working on. And yeah, I'm going to... Um, Back to the share screen. So this is a little bit different than some of the group coachings we may have done together because I am using a PowerPoint today, um, but I will read it off because you know that it's not expanding and advancing the way I'm used to. So I'm gonna go ahead and just read it off, but we're gonna have, um, we're going to talk about the 10 things that you can do to help yourself in a, in a moment here. But I want to give you some introduction to each other and then give you a structure that you can apply beyond the 10 things. So I'm going to give you a couple of structures that you may have been exposed to if you've been working with me before. And re refresh your memory or if you're brand new to this, you know, that's fine too. 
Um, but I want to make sure that you know each other as well. So I'm going to ask in a moment for you to, I'm going to break you up into rooms and I'm going to ask you to interview the people in the room. So I'll put um, this into the chat in a minute, but I'm going to ask you to interview people just basically finding out their their names, what where they're from, what they do during the day. Um, some people are retired, some people are working, some people do a little of both and or what you know some are students what what they do during the day and if they could make a wish, what would they wish to improve in their lives right now so that you get clear about who's in the room a little bit more in terms of this work that we're doing today. So I must be so exciting because uh, here's you want to hear a limiting belief that just came up for me. Three people just dropped out. <laughs> what did I do? What did I say? What did I go wrong? <laughs> anyway, that's not helpful, is it? Right? When we do that self-evaluation, it's not useful. So I can observe my mind, think that, and I can go, you know what? I have six people who are people, every single one of you are women who I admire. And so I had to talk back to my own little chatter and go, you have six awesome women in the room here and forget about the ones who left because the people, you already set the intention that the right people are in the room. So yeah, I'm just being fully transparent about about how I experience my own limiting beliefs. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. How I experienced my own thing, you know. And I have a, well, there's also my baby and my husband is actually here too. So. Oh, we got two more. Hi, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Well, so. I may ask you to unmute during the breakout rooms, okay? So, because you're going to be interviewing other people. And I would love it if they could see who you are as they get to know you. Okay. <laughs> We will shortly. <laughs> okay. I'm going to put, um, I'm going to assign the breakout rooms now. And so you're going to have a partner that you, who you might know, might not. Um, let me see. I'm going to mix it up a little. I'm trying to get you with people that maybe you, uh, it's going to be hard, hard because a lot of you know each other. Um, Okay, let's see. I think that will cause some of you who don't know each other to mingle. <laughs> okay. Um, hang on a second. I didn't put the notes. So we're going, this is what you might want to kind of ask about. So like, so rather than being like, hi, I'm da 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 and this is what I do and blah, blah, blah. I want your partners to ask you, what's your name? Where are you from? So it's an interview, you know, you, your job is to interview whoever is in your room and get to know them. Um, and if you know them, still ask these questions because it's kind of funny when you know someone because sometimes stuff pops out you didn't know. And um, what do you do during the day? What, if you could make a wish, what would you want to improve in your life right now? All right. Any questions on what you're going to do in the breakout room? Okay. No. Thank you, Lisa. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open the rooms now. And so it'll, I'm going to go ahead and give you about, um, some of you have more than one in the room. So you'll have about nine minutes, about three minutes apiece. So when you're done interviewing with those questions, you can start asking whatever other questions you want. So this is your chance to get to know the people in the room. And in about nine minutes, I'll bring you back in about 9.20. Okay. So it's gonna ask you to join, just join. All right. Now, don't understand. Pam, I'll be right back. Okay, sounds good. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Some random dude just got on. And oh. <laughs> I was like, can you unmute? And he wouldn't. 
And so I said, if you don't unmute, I'm going to kick you out. And he didn't unmute. So I kicked him out. How do you kick somebody out? You just, it's like blocking the call. Yeah. There's like these three dots over the photograph and you press the three dots. First, I sent him a message in case he couldn't hear me. Right. And I gave him like three warnings, basically. <laughs> and then I, I was like, oh, okay. You should have asked him to do his goals. <laughs> that would have made it might have made him leave real quick right <laughs> yeah. yeah I was just telling Sarah that some random person some random man came on and he would would not unmute so I I said if you don't unmute then you can't stay <laughs> and he would and then I texted him and everything and then he didn't so I kicked him out <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, in. that just happened yeah, I mean, he didn't do anything, but he just wouldn't unmute and he wouldn't like, it, it said Miguel or something. And I was like, well, oh, hello. <laughs> hey. uh, been on a hijack call. Yeah, I don't know if it's really hijacked. It might have just been, he didn't know how it works in, but if you can't. Oh, but that's uh, weird though, don't you? Because this is an invitation only. Right, well. I mean, it's not that hard to kick someone off. So no biggie things. I mean, it's not really that where pe people can pass the links and all that. Even if they're Maybe not he was looking for a date. Maybe he was looking for a date. For <laughs> he heard about your new look, Becky. And he wanted, <laughs> yes. he wanted to take advantage of it. <laughs> oh my God. That's good. Um, so was that fun getting to meet other yeah. folks in the room? Yeah. yeah. What did you what did you learn about um did you ask the question if they can make a wish, what would they wish to improve in life? Um what was there any learning that went on in, in asking that or any of the other questions for you? Yes, Lisa. I learned that I'm not alone. Good. I have a, a, there was a resonance there and something that was shared, and I was really grateful to hear it because I know COVID has its own impact, but to really, um, to maintain inspiration and motivation in that mm. state of mind is, is, has been my challenge. I'm, I'm feeling hope just talking about it. Oh, good. Yeah. I, I always feel hope when I talk about stuff like that too, just, just connection and knowing that, you know, someone else is also thinking about stuff like this, you know? Yeah. Rolanda. Why is, why is it that if we have all these commonalities, but yet we feel we are alone? Why is that? Well, before I answer, there's this like theory that you already know the answer to the question you ask. So let's just see what your guidance comes up with. <laughs> what do you think, Rolanda? Um, oh, gosh. Um, it's that, well, I mean, what's coming up in my brain is that, well, we only feel that's just germane to us because we're not whatever our other limiting beliefs are that no one else has that. It's just us. Mm, yeah. I also, I agree with you. And I think part of the, it's just us thing comes from the shame that's generated from the limiting belief. It's mm -hmm. like, it's somehow a sign of in, in, in certain circles, it is viewed as a sign of weakness to reveal that you don't feel strong and, mm -hmm. um, or that you feel insecure about something or that you have doubt or fear. And rather than it being like in this circle, it's a sign of strength that you're able to be vulnerable, that you're open. It's a sign of being evolved, you know, <laughs> this is a different group norm. But um, in some parts of our world, you know, it's not. And I think shame makes us go into the dark and not share ourselves and not be vulnerable. And so then that lack of sharing disconnects us further. Exactly what you were saying, you know, it disconnects us even further and, and makes us um, feel isolated and alone. The other part of that, that I would also say is Something that one of the things that my um, former coach Steve Chandler taught me was that uh, we we tend to think the the ego helps us to think that we are all separate selves, 
um, you know, we're all physically bounded in separation. And so our thoughts are, are done in our own isolated ways, you know, but um, we have this illusion of separateness as a result. And we don't think about the um, connections we have to others energetically, spiritually, if you will, um, just as fellow humans. And so I think it's easy for us to be in that space of, oh, I'm the only one. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Definitely one to keep exploring and chewing on for sure. I'm sure I'm going to keep thinking of that one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's get to uh, any other comments or, or things you want to share before we go into the next part or questions. All right. I'll go to breakouts. Oh, not breakout. Sorry. Wrong, wrong button. <laughs> it's share screen. Oh my gosh. That's what I get for thinking I can do an early morning. <laughs> experience. All right. Actually, I'm one side ahead of myself too. Um, so let's add that to the mix. Um, all right. So some of you might recognize this little guy E plus R equals O. So one of the one of the thing one of the schools that I've learned from is um, Jack Canfield's um, success principles, and I really got deep into that for a long time, over ten years. And one of his most basic tenets is that in order to take responsibility for our lives, we really kind of need to understand which part is our responsibility. And so there's this little formula E plus R equals O, which stands for event plus response equals outcome. And um, so the event is what life gives us. The response is our part, like what we can actually control. And the outcome is what we get. So if you are getting something from life and you're not liking the outcome, you don't necessarily get to pick the event. You don't necessarily directly pick the outcome, but you can influence the outcome by your response. So if you don't like the outcome you're getting, you can try different responses. Um, Jack talked about going and talking to his mentor, W. Clement Stone. And what, what happened with him is that he went in, he was a he was not very wealthy and he went in to go meet W. Clement Stone, who was a um, multimillionaire, self-made guy, real successful, real, real inspirational. And Jack went in there to, to ask for a job. And one of the things W. Clement Stone said is, do you ever whine, blame, or complain? And Jack was like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, well, you have to completely give up whining, blaming, and complaining if you want to be able to be successful. Um, because what you're doing when you whine, blame, and complain is you, you neglect places where you can stand in your power. I don't, I'm sure he didn't say the word stand in your power. That's a modern day phrase. But uh, you neglect places where you can take responsibility and where you can have influence over your outcome. You get into a passive mode. So really eliminate that. At first, start by limiting that. So that was the beginning of um, him really using this idea of taking 100% responsibility. And what, what we're going to talk about in terms of this R is our thinking response and our emotional outcome in just a moment. Okay. So I'm going to introduce a whole other model. <laughs> okay. But before I go into the whole other model, do you all have any questions on this model? And I won't, I cannot see all of you. So if you have a question, just unmute and ask me. All right. Um, so let's go to this next model. So we're, this next model is all about the response that we're having in terms of our thinking and the emotional and behavioral and physical outcomes that we get. Okay. So it's going to look a little bit like this, but it's more focused in on the psychology part. Could so, I ask one quick question? Sure, please. Yara, I just was thinking about it. You know, it's interesting. I'm practicing being honest, but I want to make a distinction between complaining and blaming and just speaking truth. Do you right. have anything to say? 
Yeah. And I think you also have a great answer already because of your deep work that you've done in nonviolent communication. So I want to actually hear your answer, Lisa, before I tell you mine. I should have known this was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess what I'm, so I have a need for being authentic and, and truth and honesty are very, very important to me. I think the distinction for me is in um, speaking my truth while holding accountability for my life. Mm. So understanding that I don't, um, that I can't control brain cancer, but I can respond how I hold that truth. I can, mm -hmm. I am responsible for mm -hmm. how I am with it and how I yeah. show up with that. Um, right. I speak of it, use my words. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you're going through something medically, um, you might need to complain to a doctor about like, this hurts, this doesn't feel good, whatever, you know, which I think is more in line with um, reporting, you know, reporting and giving feedback to the doctors so the doctor or doctors will know what's going on. But yeah, you, you know, speaking your truth is different from abdicating responsibility. Um, I think, you know, I've thought about this a lot too, because I feel that with, you know, there's this thing called co-regulation. And when we speak our truth to another human being and they hear us fully, and we really feel heard and understood and held in a space of what's possible rather than that we are um, somehow damaged or defective or weak or incapable or inadequate in some way. When we're really held in the space of what's possible for us and, and we're seen as, you know, um, a magnificent divine being, <laughs> that's what's coming out, out of my mouth. Um, but when we're really seen as that, um, you know, it, what happens is that it regulates us to be able to speak our truth about where we're at right now in a reportive kind of way, like what's up for me is this. Um, what we're talking about in terms of outcomes that we don't like is when we say, when we, when we focus in and fixate on um, the stuff that's out of our control, the outcome that we're gonna get is we're going to start to feel like um, uh, helpless or victimized or incapable of advancement. And we are going to block ourselves from seeing the possibility that's available to us, the opportunity, the optimism that we want to cultivate, that all of that can be blocked if we get too fixated in on those behaviors of um, whining, blaming, and complaining. Blaming and blaming, we're saying someone else or something else is responsible, not us. So we're not able to see where we have some control. And, um, and I'm not saying that sometimes someone else is, isn't responsible, but if we get too fixated on all of it being in the other person's hands, then we, we're going to start to just feel like a perpetual victim. Um, with with um, whining, we're fixating on the E, we're talking about the event over and over again, and we're not looking at our potential R's. Um, with complaining, we're, we're um, afraid to really go for the next, you know, the next R that we could do. So we're, we're again, fixating on the E and pretending that we don't have another R available. Um, so if I complain, if, if I'm complaining about um, my life partner, then I'm mentally pre pretending that there's nothing I can do about it, you know, but while at the same time holding a fantasy that there's something better out there. So I'm not looking at my R at all. So all of those things that get you away from looking at your R are going to be very disempowering for you. And so one of the things that we're gonna do today is look at different responses to create more of the outcome that you want. If you're getting self-doubt, if you're getting a sense of unworthiness or you're getting fear, those are all outcomes, they're emotional outcomes. And so 
you can influence that, even if it's a habit, even if it's something that you've grown up feeling, you can actually improve that for yourself so that you'll have more freedom. So even though I sometimes have that, you know, that I shared with you earlier today, I, it isn't, I can see it now as I'm creating that outcome by believing something, by telling myself something. Lisa, did I answer your question? Thank you very much. Thank you. And yes, I do. I have, I do believe the experience of being understood changes the brain, it like re relaxes trauma, relaxes the neurocircuitry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for adding that in as well. Thank you. Yeah. Because, you know, going through the surgery is going through all the different surgeries and feel extremely traumatic can be extremely traumatic for someone to go through. So yeah, there's a lot. I mean, Thank you. Really appreciate that question. Such a great, again, another thought provoking question. <laughs> what a great morning I'm getting to have because of you guys. Um, so on that response end, I find this a very helpful model. It comes from cognitive behavioral therapy. The very first cognitive behavioral therapy by Dr. Albert Ellis used to be called rational emotive therapy. He renamed it to rational emotive behavior therapy. All oh, that's just fact factoids. But um, what he started off with, with was this ABC theory of emotion. And in the ABC theory of emotion, we have adversity that occurs. We have our beliefs about the adversity. And then we have consequences, which are emotions, behaviors, and physical consequences are the emphasis of this model. Obviously, we could have economic consequences, we could have sociological, environmental, all sorts of, you know, consequences to our beliefs. We know that because we see how powerful beliefs are in, in doing things like um, creating more peace or, you know, conversely, causing war, right? Um, so beliefs are extremely powerful and they can have lots of consequences. But in terms of our work here, we're just focusing in on the individual. So in the individual's experience, they have emotional consequences, which are your feelings. Um, feelings are one word descriptions of your emotions, like happy, sad, angry, scared, surprised, disgust. Um, behaviors, so what actions you take or what actions you don't take. So avoidance, for example, is a behavior that we tend to do if we have fear over something, we tend to avoid the thing we're afraid of or escape from it. And then physical consequences. So do you, you know, Lisa, you use, you use the phrase relax the brain, which is really a really profound phrase um, because when the brain assesses threat, our body goes into a physical fight, flight, freeze experience. So one of those shows up usually. And so physically, when we are in a space of um, stressful emotion, we tend to feel it. It tends to show up in our various organ systems and different organ systems are more prone for some people than other, others. You know, um, my daughter, for example, gets a headache. Um, my mother used to get high blood pressure, you know, <laughs> to be like, you're making my blood pressure go up. Um, why I just remember that? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, how, how could a child like me make my mom's blood pressure go? Anyway, um, so yeah, so we have adversity that occurs. And so what I want to ask you is, does the adversity determine your emotion? Who would like to answer that or guess at the answer? And this is just a little conversational piece here. So does adversity determine your emotion? And I'm going to ask that you speak because I can't see all of you when I'm in this mode. Um, I have a guess. This is Leanne. Hi, Leanne. Um, hi. I'm going to guess that the adversity does not cause the emotion, but the belief around it does. That's very good, Leanne. Mm, That's very you. good. Very good guessing. And what made you guess that? Um, well, you know, I think a combination of things. Um, uh, my own self-work about um, 
beliefs, my own belief systems and my own study of mindfulness and yogic practices and meditation. I think I've learned um, a couple things. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think that's, you know, that's where I'm drawing from. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that is correct. Most people think that if something bad happens, they have to feel badly. Or if something good happens, they have to feel well. And so because they think that the adversity is causal, they um, can beat themselves up if they don't feel good about something good happening. Or they can, you know, or even beat themselves up if they don't feel so badly about something bad that's happened. Um, so um, it's in, in REBT, we call it the A to C connection. When people think that their adversity causes their consequence. And indeed, we found that it's the beliefs that we believe that cause our consequences. If you don't believe the belief, it won't have that kind of power over you. So if somebody tells you that you have green hair and you know your hair isn't green, that means you don't believe the belief. You won't, you won't really think twice about what they've said, you know, um, unless maybe you just dyed your hair blonde and you're worried because you were in the swimming pool and it may have turned green from chlorine or something like that. But other than that, you might not really give it a second thought. Okay. Um, so it's only the beliefs that we believe that have power over us. And if you do meditation or mindfulness or yogic practices like Leon, you develop the capacity to step back from your beliefs, to slow it down to watch, to be the observer of your thinking and not necessarily relate to the thought in an attached way. You could look at the thought as just something that's going on um, and realize that you have the choice to not attach to it. You have the choice to pick a different way of thinking. Now, we don't always automatically think the different way, right? Sometimes we have to be walked there a little bit. And that's where um, I do a lot of work with my clients is asking questions that help them to look at what they're saying to themselves and what they're creating. Uh, That's kind of work of both coaching and therapy, but in different contexts. So the more distressed you are, the more we need to focus in on what you're telling yourself, what you're allowing yourself to believe. And how do we know we're distressed? We can pay attention to our feelings and our, and our body's reactions and whether we're avoiding stuff that we really say we wanna do and we think we really wanna do. Okay, so now we get to go into the 10 ways that I, I wanted to share with you today. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I just realized I didn't tell you I wanted I wanted to be transparent about something I want to do today too is I want to introduce something to you at the end. All right, I'm not finding the slide in this moment. So um, okay, well, I'm just gonna mention that at the end I'm going to show you, I want to share with you um, something that I've been working on for a little under a year. Um, an online course that I've developed called the Anxiety Freedom Formula. And I'm going, I want to just show it to you. And then um, I'm going to make an offer on that in case anybody wants to do a pre-launch experience of that course before I launch it. Because I haven't, we just, we just, my my daughter helped me and we just got got everything into the portal yesterday. And since I haven't run it with people yet, I'm going to offer a very, deep discount on it today at the end if anybody is interested in that and if not you'll still get your 10 ways if you need to log out that's cool um all right so the first way that we start to overcome self-doubt overcome fear overcome that sense of unworthiness is showing yourself that the belief system that you have Mm -hmm. is a belief system which is abbreviated BS. Mm-hmm. So it's BS. If it's causing you to retract from your life, it's BS because you're not here to retract from your life. You're here to be here and to live your life and you're you're valuable and important and you have things to share. So show yourself that your belief system is BS. 
Some of the questions that I routinely ask my clients, you can ask yourself. And what you can ask yourself is, is my belief system causing me to have negative emotions or stress? That's the first question. So that's looking at whether it's really useful for you to have that belief system. Um, and if it's causing you negative emotions and stress, that's probably a hint that it's not that great for you. Um, then the next one is what's the evidence for and against my belief? Okay, so if I have a negative belief, what's the evidence for and against it? And then lastly, is there an alternative way to look at it that could be as true or truer? Can I see this in any other way? Right? So um, like I could see that dude that came on as just somebody who had Zoom problems, <laughs> didn't understand how to unmute. Um, and then I just kicked off somebody who maybe wanted to learn this, but they're going to have to figure out another way to learn it. Um, or I can look at it as, wow, there's some kind of like perverted stalker dude who's going to crash the call, you know, and they had like this deep interest in like finding out about us sexy women, you know, or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, so either way, like whatever's causing me stress, that's probably not the most useful belief system to hold. And I don't have any evidence for any of those beliefs. I just know that there was a dude that didn't know how to unmute that came on the call. And I don't even know if it was a dude. It was just a person with a dude's name, <laughs> you know? So it's an example. So uh, first show yourself the truth. You know that sometimes we're really, we're really better off being in the I don't know. All right, any questions on that slide before I go to the next? And I won't, I won't keep doing the thing of what do you think is the answer? I'll, I'll stop doing that now because I know we don't have time for all that. So I promise I'll just answer your questions. All right. Okay, the second way relates to the first way, but it's a, it's a different a different technique. And this little thing, set the second way, gathering a page, has caused profound shifts in my life, profound shifts in my client's life, and it's so completely easy. It's crazy. Okay. Um, well, not. Let me say it's not easy right at first until the momentum starts building. But what you're going to do is you're, if you have a label that you tend to go to and apply to yourself and that that label makes you feel less than in some way, you're going to create a page of evidence against this. Like, I mean, a whole full page, like not like on a little tiny sticky note kind of page. Okay. <laughs> like, like an eight and a half by 11 you know, writing in normal size print, okay? You're gonna fill up a page of evidence against this negative belief. So here's, the, here's a story to accompany it. Self-disclosure plus uh, hopefully helps you remember. Yeah, so a lot of the stories I tell are about my own coaching because I evolved so much from coaching. Like it's insane the person I became because of coaching. Um, but when I, one of the things that happened about, I mean, I, I coached with Steve for so many years, um, but one of the things that happens kind of, maybe I would say in the first quarter of our coaching is I revealed to him that I had a belief system that I was a loser. And I would call myself anytime I have a chance, anytime anything went south, I would think that I was a loser. And um and I said this to him on a few different sessions. And I think by about the third session, he had just really had it with that belief because he had tried to figure it out himself, like to, to ask any questions and coaxing me along. And he had just had it. And he said, you know, he said that belief, not you, but that belief is crazy. He said, it's almost like flying monkeys crazy. He's like, he's like you. And, and I, I literally believed it. I was, I believed it with all the cells in my body. Like I fully believe that this is who I was. And um, he said, we're not gonna coach until you filled up a page of, of examples of how you, that is false. He said, cause I'm really frustrated with that belief. And, um, and I was like doing all the things that I'm gonna teach you not to do here. <laughs> like taking it personally and all this stuff and reacting. 
but you know, ultimately I knew he was a benevolent force in my life and I, and I knew that his assignments tended to work. And so I did it. And, um, it took me about a week to fill up that page. And at first I couldn't think of anything. And then the thoughts started to come a little bit like, oh yeah, I've written a few books. Yeah. I, you know, I graduated from a good school, got a PhD, got a license. Spent all these thousands of hours helping people. People tell me their helps. You know, like things started to come to me, you know. And then it was like, my kids love me, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, and and I started realizing all the things I wasn't paying attention to and how I would rate myself based on one thing going wrong in the day. Um, and it really did start, it just started to release me. That idea started to release me as I showed myself the truth. Byron Katie um, is an author who, their, her website is thework.com and she talks about, she, she does a model similar to cognitive behavioral therapy called The Work. And she talks about beliefs releasing us. So we have beliefs and we hold beliefs and we attach to beliefs, but it's when we really see the, the invalidity of it that we, we end up feeling like the belief just sort of lets go of us and float somewhere else. Um, yeah, for the most part, I don't, I don't have that idea anymore. Sometimes when I talk about the idea, it gets re-triggered for a day or two. So I literally do not say that phrase very often, but I'll say it for illustration today, you know, but, um, you know, and sometimes I need to return to my thinking on the healthy way, but typically that belief doesn't run me anymore. You know, it really isn't around. Um, so I really want to encourage you to do that for yourself if you're into writing and you're able to identify a label that you apply. Um, labels like um, failure, ugly, inadequate, incapable, um, you know, those kind of harsh words that we say to ourselves, bad, wrong, um, defective came up in one of my groups the other day. Everybody raised their hand that they had that at some point or another. I was like, wow. That, but that is an interesting label. Um, and, it, and, you know, we get these labels due to the fact that our brains are, are, our brains are designed for survival, not for happiness, not for fulfillment. They're designed to help us survive. So as a result, our brains simplify life. They simplify life in terms of good and bad. And easy labels pop into mind. So if somebody says something bad to us, we think we're bad when we're little kids, right? And we're even globally rated like bad girl, you know? Um, and they're very powerful beliefs that happen, but we can shake them up. We can convince ourselves that they're not, you know, they're really, there's too much evidence. We can overpower it with evidence. All right, any questions on that technique? Okay. And if you do, again, just unmute and ask since I can't see everybody. All right. So can I? Yeah, please. Finding questions. And we just had somebody join us, right? Oh, just now? Yeah. Okay, let me stop the share and take a look. Ah, Kevin. Can you unmute Kevin? Hi, good morning. Hi, could you um, show your video? Uh, yeah, here in a, in a second. Okay. <laughs> All right. We just like to know who we're talking to, especially when new people pop in. Thank you. Lisa. That's, yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, Kevin, you're going to unmute your video for us for a sec. Just, we don't have to stay unmuted just for a second. We want to see your face. Yeah. Give me one second. <laughs> He's just like, kind of waking I'm up trying here. to get my shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know you were going to do this, Dr. Pam. Mm. Tell me where you came from, Kevin. Was it Meetup, Facebook, one of my other things? Um, I saw uh, the events on Facebook yesterday, and um, I was interested. Just, yeah. uh, just waking up a little bit late for it, I guess. Cool. Okay. Well, you sound legit to me. 
<laughs> Thanks. I'll tell you I'm what, just... we'll, we'll move on with the program and I'll, um, I'll look at you in a little while for unmuting purposes. Okay. Okay. Just, just our, my really advanced, you know, FBI level intelligence screening, you know, is <laughs> see your smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Alrighty, so let me go ahead and share the screen again. Thank you for, for letting me know about that, Lisa. I don't know how come you could see, but I couldn't. <laughs> anyway. Um, your video settings, you're not showing the people um, that are on with their, vi with their video off. Oh. If you thought that I dropped off and I just turned the video off for a bio break. Oh my gosh. So that means there's more people than I thought in the room. <laughs> okay. Our total of six, seven, uh, eight of us. Oh. Hi, happy eight. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, you're now my new uh, assistant for this call. <laughs> anyway, yeah. you've been nominated. All right, so we're on the third way. Now you're gonna see relationships between these, but they're actually slightly different. So third way relates to what I was saying before, but it's a little bit different. It's about changing the form of your sentences. So rather than labeling, is the third way is stop labeling yourself. By the way, if anyone wants me to send you a link with a copy of the slides, then just um, put that in your, in the. if you wanted to send it as private, that's fine. Um, you just select me as the recipient of the message, but put um, your email address in a private chat to me and um, write the word slides or something by it. And I will, um, at the end of this, I'll send you the link so you can have a copy of the slides. But okay, the third way is to stop labeling yourself. So change the form of your sentences. So we tend to um, label ourselves. For example, I am bad if I, did, if I did this badly. And Dr. Ellis taught us to say it is bad rather than I am bad. It is bad, not I am bad. Um, again, a failed act doesn't make a failure. So if something fails for you, it's better to go, well, that failed, <laughs> you know, kind of with a little sense of humor, maybe, rather than saying, I'm a failure. Um, so we want to not rate ourselves we want or label ourselves based on a unitary dimension because we're multidimensional, multifaceted. Hey, Kevin, thank you. <laughs> we're, I appreciate you unmuting there. Thank you. Um, you don't have to say unless you, I mean, unmuted unless you feel like it. You, it's just, it's great to see your face though. So thanks. Um, so yeah, so we want to change that form of events. Any questions on how to do that? Does anyone have trouble rewriting that, you know, or separating from the, the action from the person? All the time. <laughs> yeah, Lily, would you mind sharing a little bit more on what, what's coming to mind for you? Well, it's just like my brain goes so fast that like if I like... I don't know if I did something stupid. I'm like, oh, I'm stupid. Um, like I say it so quickly. I don't even realize that I label myself that quickly. And then it takes a long time to undo it. It's just habit. Yeah, good. And you said something really powerful. It's just habit. So uh, what would you say? What would you like to start building as a new habit instead of saying I'm stupid? If the word stupid is coming to mind, how could you re rewrite that sentence? Um, I guess it would, if I hear myself say it, I'll say, um, no, I feel stupid right now, but that doesn't mean that I am stupid. Okay. That's good. And can we remove it even one more thing, one more from that rather than uh, you can say, I feel stupid. It doesn't mean I'm stupid. That's really good too. That when, when we feel a certain way and we convince ourselves that our feeling is the truth, that sometimes it's called emotional reasoning. Um, but um, I'd also like you to take it a step further. So step back one step more, maybe saying, this is stupid, but I'm not stupid. Or yeah. this, you know, this outcome, or this outcome is kind of stupid, or this mistake was maybe a bit stupid, but I'm not stupid. Yes, or I'd prefer that this was different. Uh, but I'm not stupid. Yeah, even better. That's even a step beyond that. So you're, each time we step back from that label, we're going to gain more confidence and, and recognize that we're separate from the outcome. The outcome is there 
because of something maybe that we contributed to to create the outcome. But just because we got an outcome that we didn't like, that we didn't prefer, good word, Lily, just because we didn't prefer that outcome doesn't mean that we have to interject it as though we are wrong, bad, failure, stupid, any of those words that we might have um, applied. Yeah. Does that, do you think that would help you, Lily, to just to replace it now every time? Yes. Okay, good. So as you, as you hear yourself say that, let's instantly go to say that sentence again that you're going to say. Um, I heard that this was different, but I'm not stupid. Mm -hmm. I prefer that this was different, but I'm not stupid. How does that feel when you say that? It, I feel like it really removes me from like, it, it really removes me from the blame, I suppose. Like if I say, I prefer this was different, that's, yeah. that's not me. And you know what I also like about that? As you move one step back, when you say, I prefer it was different. You even take the value judgment off it. You take the word stupid off it, right? Yeah. So you take all value, all meaning off of it. You just don't like it the way it is. You want it to be different from what it is. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't make you stupid. So you create a boundary between the event and you. Yes. I so, like that. Yeah. Very useful. Very useful. So think for a moment, all of you who are here about a sentence you could replace and write it down. If, if you are willing to look at that, a sentence that you would be willing to practice replacing. You might even use Lily's beginning. I prefer that this was different. I'm going to add that to the slide. I prefer that this is different. Um, what did you say? But I'm not stupid. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. All right. So the fourth way is a technique called thought stopping. So say you've engaged in some of those other ways and they're just not working for you. Um, you get, if you have intrusive thoughts, for example, sometimes when people have gone through a traumatic experience, they will have thoughts that just come in that are unwanted, that they don't like, and they just invade their brain, their brains. Um, in addition, people can have intrusive thoughts due to obsessive compulsive tendencies. So, uh, you know, if you don't wash your hands 20 times, you know, something bad's going to happen. Um, so you, that might be an intrusive thought that you don't like and you don't want. Um, and then you could have, you know, limiting ideas that are intrusive. Okay. Like, um, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. Okay. Um, or you get into what we would call a thought rut. So you just get into a bad habit of thinking something about yourself. Um, that's bad. You know, like I'm, I'm not worthy, you know, um, like Wayne's world for those of you from in my generation and watch Saturday Night Live. Um, I'm not worthy. So yeah, those are, I might joke about that, but I'm joking about the thought, not about the person holding the thought. I want you to know that. So um, if you have that, it's crazy that this could work. When I first heard it, I'm like, that's too simple to be able to work. How could this be? But with thought stuffing, what you do is you say the word stop, first of all. Okay. So you, um, so let's say you're having this thought over and over and over. You say, stop. You might say it out loud if you're alone or if you're with someone who gets what you're doing. Just say, stop. And there's something about that word that actually we're so trained to stop with that word that it tends to help the thoughts to stop. And then we want to immediately redirect. For some people, they can just say stop and they're done and they can go on. But most of the folks I've worked with need to also add in the second step of redirection. And redirection means you get your, your brain into something. Um, you know, um, I had a client who said that her anxiety was really helped when she did thought stopping and she would redirect to doing math problems. Um, and then later I found a study that showed that the math problem doing rote math problems, math problems that are fairly easy, but engaging actually do lower anxiety. I was like, oh my gosh, for, for people who don't have a math phobia, of course. Um, 
Grounding is another thing you can do where you do some breathing, you pay attention to what you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you smell, what you feel. That's mindfulness. So you go into your sensory system and that grounds you. Um, or just doing a task that's on your list of to-dos, like doing the laundry, doing the dishes, making your bed, taking a shower. Those things can be really helpful for redirection. Family. Yeah, I was just going to ask if there were any questions. So you read my mind. You must be intuitive. <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> um, so I was talking with a friend the other day, and um, I was talking about how I was um, having an awareness of some old thought patterns um, in a new scenario. And she suggested um, that I, when I recognize that I was having the negative thoughts to replace them with gratitude for the recognition. So I'm curious what you think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we are going to talk about thought replacement in a minute, but if you, okay. but you could use, you could use the gratitude as a redirection. Okay. So you could, you could use the thought stopping, you could say stop and then redirect to gratitude practice. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So some people don't need to do the thought stopping, they can just go right to replacement. Um, mm -hmm. But you can use the replace as a redirection if the if you feel flooded by those thoughts, for example. Um, or that they're really, or if you're obsessing or stuck or getting intrusive thoughts. So, yeah. And part of the way that we know, um, it's, um, I mean, this may be obvious, but if it's thought we don't like that we, even though we know it's BS and even though we've done all those things that I've told you about earlier, um, you know, that we might need to do this added step. This is a more behavioral technique. Yeah. This behavioral technique works with, with students. We use this in our school um, oh. system. We have actually, it's called the stop and think room. And so if a student is doing, you know, being obsessive about something or not following directions, we will say, oh, you know what? I think you need to go and to the stop and think room. And when they get there, they're allowed to jump on the trampoline, they can do puzzles, they can talk with somebody about how they're feeling or why they're behaving in the way they are. And then after they're there, they can stay there as long as they need. And then once they've left there, they come back and they've been redirected into following second grade classroom. But it really works. We, you know, and some of them at first think of it as a bad thing, so they don't wanna go there. But I have had students ask me, they've come up and said, Miss LeBeau, I think I need to go to stop and think. And so they, uh -huh. they know to redirect themselves. So it's very successful. It works very successfully with them. That's awesome. That's a really interesting story too. I think, you know, the fact that they're showing um, self-regulation yeah. at that age, that they're, that they're, you know, initially it looks like a timeout type of punishment maybe, but then they realize, wait a minute, this isn't actually a timeout. I'm not facing the wall or whatever. No, <laughs> no, they can just do fun. They can do fun things if they want. Yeah. Jump Like one little guy just needs to get rid of his anger. So he will go in there and he will jump and jump and jump on the little trampoline. And then he comes back and it's like, he's gotten rid of the anger. Wow. That makes me want to get a little trampoline. <laughs> Sounds fun. What that that must be a fun room for the kids. Um, yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that, Becky. I appreciate it. Any other questions on that one? All right. Uh, all right. The fifth way is prepare and practice. So sometimes we have beliefs about our ability to perform a task or to try something new. Um, Let's say you're going to a job interview, for example, you know, that might be a big deal for a lot of people. And so when you feel shaky about something, if you're rusty at it, or you just haven't even done it before, what you want to do is prepare and practice as much as possible. Um, as obvious as that sounds, sometimes we take that phase for granted. We just 
go in thinking we ought to just know what to do. We ought to just have everything figured out, you know, um, especially if, it, if there's overlap between skills that, you know, like, let's say, um, you know, if you are, if you're a teacher, you may think, well, I'm really good at talking to people or whatever, so I should be able to, you know, do this particular presentation to ask for a donation for a charity. And then all of a sudden you go in and you have butterflies and you're like, well, usually I just walk in and talk and now I don't, I don't even know what to say. I'm blinking. Right. Um, so if something like that, you know, something like that, we are taking for granted that we have a skill set. And so we're not preparing and practicing. So what we want to do is remember that that has value. Anytime we want to gain confidence in something, the more you prepare and practice, the more you will gain confidence. So uh, my daughter had a job interview recently and she Googled the questions that are most likely to be asked in this job interview and prepared for it. And then she, she ended up getting the job. So it was helpful for her to read the questions, write out answers, practice reading her answers. And she said that every question that she had studied, kind of like studying for a test, ended up being on this job interview, <laughs> um, um, except the one that she was worried about. So, <laughs> which was something like, if you're caught on a desert island, what two things do you want to have with you? And then, then, you know, she was very glad she was asked that one because she was like, I don't know which two things. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. So anyway, pre preparation and practice gave her confidence where she might not have had the confidence. Any questions on that one? So I'm going to ask that one of you volunteer to share a time that you've prepared or practiced for something and share what the effect of that practice was. Now, realizing that, you know, sometimes um, sharing takes extra courage. We, we all will see you as a very courageous, brave person for sharing. So um, who would be willing to share something that they prepared for or practice and the effect of that preparation and practice? So none of you ever practice? Well, I'm really glad I added this uh, to the mix. Okay. Okay. I'll share because I have to live by this. And um, I was thinking you might have to practice every now and then. <laughs> well, I wanted to give others a space to speak. Because you're so sweet. Thank you for, for thinking of that as well. But yeah, I, your, your experience is being called forth. So let's hear it. Well, and, and one thing that I've discovered is because I, I have been a professional um, um, performer for 20 years, it's when I'm on stage, there's always an extra anxiety that I that I have to account for if I'm going to do something really well. Ah. So I've, I've gotten really self aware about my practice techniques, you know, um, sometimes I will um, try to play the whole song without looking at my fingers. Sometimes I'll play um, in front of a mirror. Sometimes I'll play um, um, my tendency, my go-to is just to read it, like just to read and play and sing. And, and it's completely ineffective if I'm performing that way. So um, I'm learning that the more engaging I can be and I'll, I'll practice engaging. Of course, I'll visualize too, if I'm extra nervous. Um, but that's definitely, this is definitely an arena that I practice. And then I'll, I'll even practice, uh, you, you shared in another group, um, you know, when you hit the ops obstacle, sometimes I'll visualize hitting an obstacle and how I choose to deal with it. Like when I screw up on stage, I have a drummer that'll start playing really loud in order to bury me. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> but that's great. You kind of have that backup plan in place. Yeah, yeah. So there's a few things, yeah. That is so cool. Um, so what do you think is the effect of the practice for you? Um, for me, the the overall effect is always positive. It's just that I I discover uh, like another technique too is playing it faster than I a few notches faster in my practice so that I can relax a little bit. The goal is to get set an intention of being fully present and not thinking mm -hmm. while I'm performing, but allowing it to just happen because it is more practical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great, Lisa. Um, the, thank you for sharing that. And 
Yeah, that it's it's um, you know, we think about certain things requiring practice, you know, but I think when when you do that as your you know livelihood, you know, I mean, when you're you're a professional musician, singer, songwriter, and that's your livelihood, that it's like that's a way of life for you. You know, you that you're that's just something probably you probably don't even think about it. You just know that you're going to prepare and practice. Um, I would imagine. I paid really. Oh, you're muted again for some reason. I paid for it when I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I heard a quote once about piano that um, that if you practice once a week, your friends won't know that you didn't practice, but your teacher will know. <laughs> So anyway, random quote. But yeah, it, it goes for other things too. Like public speaking anxiety is a big fear for a lot of people. Um, you can prepare and practice for that. Going on a date, might, if you haven't been dating in a while and you feel rusty, can elicit a lot of anxiety. Um, you can do covert rehearsal, which is practicing in the brain. You use the word visualization. It's a, um, that's another you know term for it but it was originally called covert rehearsal. So another FBI strategy, um, you know, where you, you sit and sit with it in your brain, your head and visualize the outcome and visualize yourself with different scenarios and visualize yourself um, figuring out the coping strategy and being successful at it. So you want, ultimately when you visualize, you want to visualize yourself figuring it out and being successful. Um, so even if you encounter a little bit of challenge that you'll be successful. So that's a form of practicing. And as you do that, you'll, you'll think about things that you might want to do as you do that. So, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing. Let's go to the next one. So the sixth way to start to defeat our self-doubt, our fear, and our unworthiness is to actually work on a goal until you reach it. There is something powerful about stretching beyond where we are now. Um, and it doesn't need to be an all consuming, difficult goal for it to create a boost of your sense of confidence, your sense of efficacy, but you do want to be willing to stretch a little bit, okay? So take a moment right now, if you're not already working on something, just write down something that you'd be willing to work to reach, willing to work to improve. Maybe it's the thing that you said in the breakout room before. If we have extra time later, we may go back to this one and have you sit with your partners and Actually, I think we could probably do that. So, so for a moment, let's write down a goal that you're willing to work on. It could be any goal at all. And I want to emphasize, it could be a small goal. It could be that something you might worry sounds like a small goal. It could be something like, um, I'm going to wake up 10 minutes earlier every day. And that may mean I have to go to bed 10 minutes earlier too, if, I, if my body's real meticulous about time for some reason. Um, but I'm going to wake up 10 minutes earlier so that I can meditate every day, or I'm going to wake up 10 minutes earlier so I can, um, write down the food I'm going to eat today so I can, you know, improve my nutrition or what have you, but I'm going to wake up 10 minutes earlier. That might be a goal. You know, it doesn't have to be incredible. It can be small. Um, but it's something that you're willing to work to reach. and. There, there used to, there used to be um, a, a little phrase, 21 days to build a habit, which has been debunked by the research. It's really 66 days on average, at least. Um, so if you're walking around teaching people 21 days to build a habit, like take that away and replace 21 with 66. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, and that's like on average, but there's, it can range to even longer. It takes a while. So if you want to build a new habit, can you do the habit for 66 days straight? 
Um, and think about what steps you'll need to take to be successful. I'll write down a few steps. I'm gonna be quiet and let you write down a few steps that you would need to take. And in a moment, you're gonna share that in your breakout room. And um, I wanna also mention this, because I was, I was practicing and preparing yesterday. And I did a quick version of this talk for my daughter. This is how I secretly input um, healthy psychology into her head. Is I'm like, can you help me? <laughs> I'll pay you. <laughs> I want you to listen. <laughs> listen to me run through this. It's going to take an hour. Uh, and she said to me, well, I have all these goals, but I can't figure out how to get them all into my day. Um, so I don't like this one because I can never get get success because I have all these goals and I can't get them all into my day and I was like you know what I had to learn to do was do a week at a glance versus a day at a glance in terms of my goals so I would program say that I wanted to do I would put one thing on Monday Wednesday and Friday and another thing on Tuesday Thursday and Saturday so that I'm still working on my goals and I'm working on different goals on different days but I'm able to get to my goal by only giving myself so much in a day so that was helpful to her. She said, you ought to put that on the slide because that helps me. And I said, okay. Um, so another question that I asked her was how would you feel if you reach, reach your goals? Sit and think about what it would feel like to reach the goal. And write down the emotion or feelings or thoughts that might come to you if you did reach the goal that you set for yourself. So the research on this stuff is that we get an improved sense of what's called self-efficacy, the sense that we can do things, that we're capable. So when you set a goal and you reach it, it starts to improve your sense that you can do things. So that's why we wanna do this. So I'm going to get us in, let me stop sharing. Ah, okay. Um, uh, let's see if we can do, breakout rooms again. Um, I'm going to have we create let's see. I'm going to read out the names and if your name isn't on here, let me know. Anne, Becky, Kevin, Jacqueline, Lily, Rolanda, Leanne, Lisa, and Sarah. So if I didn't read your name, let me know. There's something I might have done on Zoom to mute the videos. All right, um, I'm going to open all the rooms. And what I'd like you to do is just share your goal, um, share your steps and share what you would do to reach, in terms of steps of reaching the goal and then share what you would feel. So just the same questions we just had you write down. You're just gonna share what you wrote down with another person. Well, it's gonna be another two people actually. Actually, let me recreate. Yeah, no, that's okay. Three per room is good. You'll get to know more people. Okay, so I'm going to open the rooms and I'm going to give you, um, let's see, six minutes. So it's two minutes a piece to share. And yeah, let's, let's, any questions on what we're going to be sharing? Okay. And I will call you back in in six minutes. And so yeah, have fun with your partners. So um, let's see, it looks like Jacqueline, you need to accept the join request, please. And um, yeah, otherwise you will miss out on the interaction that is available to you. So I am going to, yeah, good. I'm gonna pause the recording for a sec second. Different, we all three had sort of the same outcomes, cool. which was strength or, uh, sense of empowerment or a sense of integrity and so it all what I noticed was we all had that same sense regardless of the goal 
That's interesting. Wait, so say that again. You all had the same sense of what? Integrity? We all had the same uh, like idea of how we would feel. So oh it wasn't God. expressed in the same words, but the idea behind how I would feel was so similar between the three of us. Oh. That, um, it was just really interesting to me that different goals, s same, but obviously the same for different people. Yeah. Um, That's really interesting too. If you think like, about, I you know, if, um, uh, if someone else sets your goal for you versus if you set your goal for you, right? Um, like we know what we want to do, right? And it's like when someone else tells us what to do, it sort of takes that away in some, in, in some respects. And, um, but it doesn't even matter what you pick for yourself. You're picking what you want for you, right? And when you do that, it's, it tends to result in this uniform positive emotion. So there's, um, there's a researcher by the name of Dr. Martin Seligman, who is the founder of Positive Psychology, and he's written a book called Flourish. And it's all about, you know, creating more uh, pleasure in your life, actually. And he, yeah, I was sort of like astonished because I had, I had this Pleasure and Prosperity Facebook group. And I was like, oh, oh, and in fact, flourishing, he said, equates with prosperity. I was like, ah. <laughs> He's using the same kind of language with different, you know, different experimental stuff that he does. But um, that's one of the parts of it, you know, is is pursuing stuff that is meaningful to you, creating mm -hmm. that, making that be a part of your life, building that in. And it starts with some of the goals that you set. Um, and yeah, so Leanne, you were going to also share something. Yeah. yeah. I Oh, there's like an echo that Oops. I'm hearing at least. Um, maybe I'll, I'll mute while you share. Maybe it's me. Who knows? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, it, well, well, um, this is perhaps not the um, response that you uh, might be either expecting or looking for, uh, but I'm just going to be vulnerable and say, um, I noticed myself um, have this quick um, thought run through my head or maybe a series of thoughts of my goal is less worthy because I'm not struggling with a health issue right now. So I had to just kind of set that aside uh -huh. and yeah. proceed anyway, you know, and I did. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, I can talk to myself later and, or, you know, like know that, yeah, it is worthy because what I'm trying to do is, um, you know, whatever, you know, I don't have to go into the details of, of that yeah. now. i just wanted to mention that I, that I recognize that quick, unworthy yeah. note and then press past it. So that's excellent. Then that's exactly what needed to be said here. So um, I appreciate you opting for vulnerability in this case and going outside of your comfort zone and sharing that. Thank you. And yeah, I, th I think that um, one of the things that happens when we set a goal is we get considerations, fears, and roadblocks. Um, considerations being you know, well, am I going to, I'll use the 10 minutes or everything. Um, am I going to be able to do that because um, my husband's a sensitive sleeper and I might be waking him up if I wake up and, you know, is that going to be a problem for him? Okay. Um, fears, an example of fears would be, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can do this. Right. Um, and then Actually, I also want to add in limiting beliefs to that list. Um, the fourth is roadblocks. So I'm literally blocked because there's, uh, let's say that the doctor says I have to sleep this number of minutes or something. And I, I'm literally blocked from fulfilling that because I'm not allowed, you know, uh, by my healthcare provider or something to wake up earlier. Um, 
and I'm already sleeping the minimum number, let's say of hours. And now if I take off 10 more minutes, you know, that's just going to do me in. Um, so, and then we have limiting beliefs. And in our group today, since the focus is on self-doubt, you know, and fear and um, unworthiness, those are the variety of beliefs that a lot of, I mean, you guys are brave enough to actually study it and do something about it. So like, that's incredible right there that you own it and, and embrace it and are working with it as a part of your experience, as opposed to just like, you know, pretending it doesn't exist, <laughs> denying it making it worse through some other means, whatever. But yeah, limiting beliefs come up when we're about to cross from where we're comfortable into where we're uncomfortable. Something new. We're gonna, in order to do something new, we're going to experience a bit of discomfort. And that just that recognition that we're going to experience some discomfort tends to turn on that limbic system response, you know, a little bit of that fight, flight, freeze mode. And the ego goes, Oh, we better protect this being. We better feed it some beliefs that have worked in the past to slow it down. Um, keep it, keep it in its current state because we know that's safe. If you know we're we're here to survive, we're not here to grow. That's what the ego is saying. Keep yourself safe. But when, as soon as you start to move and grow, you know we're that that's a threat to the ego. But your inner being wants to grow, right? So you, Leon, is you did exactly right. You, I mean, in terms of what we're talking about here today, you recognize the thought, you decided not to let it run you. You put it to the side and you kept going. And that's the power of really working at a goal. If you really keep working at it, is you're gonna face all those limiting beliefs and then you're gonna move past. Lisa, I saw your hand go up. Was that a share coming out? So yeah, to and I wanted to thank you, Leanne, for being transparent with that. That is so meaningful to hear. And I want to share the irony for myself is that because I am just trying to get back into a place of stasis, that I have also been critical about my goals. Like, oh my God, I'm just trying to be normal. You know, I'm just trying to feel feel some normalcy and joy again. And I've had this envy for, you know, people operating in these goals or that are up here. So thank you so much for sharing that. And no. yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Appreciate that gratitude as well. Uh, you know, I really wanna encourage you to feel comfy sharing in this setting because we're all here to grow. And I um, really want you to feel invited if you have something you'd like to add to this conversation about goals. Um, how about, is there anyone else who wants to add to this conversation, ask a question or just share a self-observation that came up in your group as you were looking at yourself and your journey? Um, yes, Rolanda. Oh, you're muted, Rolanda. Um when you mentioned looking at starting looking at uh, tackling a goal and you offered the um week at a glance versus a day at a glance and i think at least for me when i think about you know the resumption of of um exercise you think about i need to do this every day and and <clears throat> so, well no and and so you it's i guess it's self sabotage and you stop yourself and then, but to look at it as you framed it, look at looking at it as, okay, if I haven't exercised in, in, in three months, then why am I gonna go out and try to do it every day? Yeah. Because then it's, I won't say it's burnout, but you, I'm putting more pressure on myself. Yeah. Be something that's not, and it's not necessary to do that. Right. It's not necessary. Isn't it funny when we realize that? <laughs> that's this is serious. You know, you go out and walk. I'll, I'll walk when I walk. I'll get on the stepper when I want to get on the stepper. But also, I mean, that's the overall thing. But also, if we want to take it as building a habit, um, very much so like when um, I started med started meditating. And it's funny, you said for a habit for 66 days. And I looked at my inside timer and I've been meditating for 266 days. 
Wow. Today. So it's like, oh, it's some synchronicity there. But it is the make it easy. It, make it easy. Don't front load it. And when when you front, when I front load something, I look at it and I find it insurmountable. And then I say, I don't want to do anything. And mm-hmm. then I feel bad because I set this goal up and then now I'm not following through. Excellent. That, those are that, those are great insights that go along with your insight <laughs> insight app. I think yes. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, have you always? I'm going to ask you a question. You can choose to share or not, Rolanda. Have you always meditated? No. And well, I did that. Um, what probably when we first met 2013, and you sent me my first meditation audio meditation. Yeah. And, yeah. And I, I did it for a while, then I dropped off. And then um, there was an event last year that um, I turned to meditation to get some grounding and some clarity and have been going, well, 266 days straight. And I feel that I've not only gone from meditating in the morning, sometimes I'll meditate in the afternoon and I meditate at night. Yeah. It's so. great. I mean, it's grown for you, you know, it's taken, but if you had the very first time you and I talked about incorporating meditation, if I had said, I want you to do it for at least 266 days, two times, two to three times a day. It's like, that's like, a, Oh, I'll do it for a week. And then it's like, Phew. yeah. Right. But if I said to you, this is what I said to someone yesterday, I'd like you to do this three minute meditation this week. You know, the brain is like, I can totally do that. Yeah. You know, so that's how we want to talk to ourselves about these things that we're making ourselves feel badly about. It will build, Mm -hmm. you know, Hey, I thought of a new phrase. Instead of if you build it, they will come. If you build it, it will build. Yeah. Yeah. You inspired that, Rolanda. Thank you. You know how. (laughs) You know, my my struggle has always been thinking how people think of me and how they perceive me and how, how I'm limited by that, how I limit myself with thinking I'm not good enough or I'm not this. All of a sudden, I, you know, I had to have this surgery on my eyes and All of a sudden, I, since I was 15 years old, have worn glasses, and now I don't have to. And it's like, after I had the surgery, I thought, well, I not only am seeing things differently from my point of view, but I can also change how I, what I see also to how I feel and not be this one who thinks, like I was saying to Lisa and Rhonda, you know, I've always thought. What am I doing with people like Lisa Firestone and Jana Stanfield? I'm just this little teacher from Minnesota. And now I've got this idea of you, know, you take the glasses off and I can be somebody completely different. Oh. I can be an exotic model if I want, if I think I can. So it's kind of, you kind of learn not to be limited by the old beliefs of what you thought you were by just getting a new look. That, that kind of helped me. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's, um, it's amazing how your, your shift in vision caused a shift in vision. You know, I really appreciate you sharing that. And we, we are really, uh, there's a, there's a thought in one of the branches of psychology that we're role takers, you know, so you go home and you take the role of Let's say you go to your family of origin home, you take the role of son, daughter, you know, child in the house. Uh, Ram Das said, no matter how evolved you are, or if you think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your family, right? Is the famous quote. Um, so we, you know, go into a specific um, setting and we maybe can feel very strong in that setting or go into a different setting and feel very um, self-doubting, right? So so we're role takers in certain respects. So if you can put on a different role, in a way, when you take off your glasses, you're you're assuming a different role in a way. And so if you can put on that different role for yourself, that can help. 
Um, all right, I want to go back to some slides. Thanks for all those shares. I let me ask a quick question uh, for those of you in the room. With all the sharing, do you feel if you feel closer to the people in the room because of the sharing? Let's just see your hand go up. So, all right. So some of you, most of you, feel closer. Um, so that's something. Oh, and Lily gave us a thumbs up. <laughs> um, so if you, yeah, thank you all. So it looks like unanimously it is a closer feeling as we share. So keep that in mind. If you're wanting to share, I invite you to do that at some point during the rest of our meeting here. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and finish the content part. So mm -hmm. Let's see. So the seventh way we're on number seven here is baby steps with rewards. And we were kind of alluding to that in this conversation with Rolanda. What I said is, you know, if I told you to do 266 days in a row, three times a day of meditation, <laughs> she would have been like, you're fired. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> you're bad for my self uh, confidence instead of good for it. <laughs> um, one of the things that that I employed when I was working on my um, my different books was this thing that I learned from Jack Canfield called the Rule of Five, and basically the idea is if you would do five things a day toward your goal, you would eventually reach your goal, and so you don't have to spend your whole day working on your goal, right? Just do five things a day toward it, and they can be five little things. So. You might, you know, when I was writing the first manuscript, sometimes it was just five, uh, first manuscript of my first book, sometimes it was just five sentences, you know, that's all that came out. Sometimes it was editing five pages. Sometimes it was rewriting a paragraph five times, you know, it, it was very nonspecific. Sometimes it was researching, um, you know, reading at least five research articles, you know? Um, so what I love about rule of five is it can be so flexible for whatever the goal is talking about, whatever it is that you're wanting to achieve, it can flex and bend with that at the same time as it contains that forward momentum experience and that sense that you're, you're making progress the other thing I loved about the rule of five is it was achievable. It wasn't, I didn't have to spend, you know, 10 hours a day working on something. I, I could, you know, at the time for my first manuscript, I would drop off my children at preschool because they were that young and go to the nearby Starbucks and sit, you know, and write while they were, or do whatever my five things ended up being while they were in preschool and then turn around. It was like half a day. I only had like two hours to do it, you know? but I was able to make momentum because I created that, you know, that I wanted to follow that rule of five. And then rewards sometimes can be helpful too. So you can, you can go, once I get to this milestone, I'm gonna reward myself with something. Um, I was changing my eating habits all year and I'm off sugar and flour and stuff like that. So um, that, was a real process for me. But once I got to a certain um, weight goal, I wanted to get the specific exercise equipment that I used at the gym all the time that I missed because I don't go to the gym anymore. So I got myself a piece of exercise equipment once I got to my goal, but it was, it was kind of like a nice way to reward myself. So we wanna build those rewards in. Um, don't take those for granted. Those really do help, you know, especially in days where you're not sure you wanna work that hard, <laughs> but five things a day, you know, think about what those could be for you. All right. And by the way, um, if you want a copy of the slides, just put, just indicate your email address in the chat and I'm happy to send you a copy if you haven't already indicated that. Um, the eighth way, I think you're going to want a copy of this slide maybe, I don't know, maybe not, but I spent some time thinking about these um, and practice what I would call worthy replacements. So one of the things that people who have a lot of, they walk around with a lot of self-doubting ideas, a lot of um, 
critique, a lot of compa social comparison, um, self-comparison, fear. They, they tend to have certain verbal habits. So they tend to use certain phrases a lot in their own heads or out loud. And they, um, those are kind of like reinforcing what they already feel makes them feel badly about themselves. So it's, it becomes, you know, a self-perpetuating thing where, where, you know, they say the, th the negative thing and then they feel that way. And then they say the negative thing again, and they feel even worse and they say the negative thing and it starts to feed itself. So we want to reverse that. And one of the quick ways you can do it is to start replacements. Um, I think Leanne mentioned earlier about using a replacement of gratitude as a practice when she has a negative thought. But these, these replacements are a little bit targeted to the actual negative thought in a way. So um, these are for self-criticism, self-comparison, taking stuff personally and over-apologizing, which I am marking on the last one right now. Um, so self-critique, you want to replace it with what am I learning or what did I learn? Usually we critique ourselves when we think we didn't do well at something. So rather than focusing on what went wrong, focus on what was the lesson? What did I learn? And that is a coaching question very often. You can self-coach. We're transforming the inner critic to an inner coach when we do these questions. So instead of saying, you know, I did this badly, what did I learn? What am I learning? Those questions will elicit different answers for you and you will see the value in the experience instead of using it to beat yourself up. The second one is replace self-comparison with the answer to this question, what do I wanna work on? Or what's good about me? One of you mentioned Jana. When I first mentioned, Jan when I first met Jana, I, was, I went through a fangirl phase because I listened to her music forever. And um, so I had like a fangirl reaction to her at first rather than just like, oh, it's nice to meet a new friend. And all I could think about was how much better she was on every possible dimension than me. Um, so I just was like, she does this better. She does that better. She thinks better. She does this, uh, like everything about her was better in my head. And I hadn't gone through that kind of like comparison process since I had been in high school. I was like, why do I feel like I'm in high school again? You know? Um, and I journaled about it and I realized what I was doing. And I, um, so I started ask, answering those questions like, what, what do I want to work on? <laughs> you know? Like, it's really not useful for me to do this comparative process. She's had a different life, a different life path, has different interests, different talents. Everything's different. Like, why am I doing this, right? So I don't want to do this anymore. So what do I want to work on and what's good about me? And that allowed that whole complex that I was having to just settle and release, you know, going really focused on the answers to that question, really writing on that, really thinking through that. and then you know, recognizing that we're all human on this journey, you know, and that helped me to settle that down, you know, plus her saying, would you cut that out? <laughs> didn't, that, that didn't, um, that, that was helpful. <laughs> um, okay. And then the next one was replace taking it personally with the answer to this question, what might they have going on? And um, so when someone is like, like someone is like, is that your goal? You know, <laughs> like, you're like, I'm really stretching and growing myself because I'm going to wake up 10 minutes earlier, you know? And um, that means that's going to open up the world for me. You know, you don't understand that little hinges turn big doors, you know? And I am like this 10 minutes earlier thing is going to change my life. And you're like thinking this and you share it with someone and they're like, is that all you're doing? You know, and all of a sudden this, you just feel deflation happen, you know? So first of all, ask what might they have going on? Maybe for them, that wouldn't be good enough. So therefore they project their sense of unworthiness onto you. Um, and also maybe they're just a critical person and they're toxic. So just kind of hold the space that might be happening. If it happens a few more times, you might want to consider avoiding that person for the reason of their behavior 
uh, being consistently not useful or helpful or supportive. But it may just be that they have something going on that day and they're in a bad mood and they're just lashing out at everyone, you know? So avoid taking things personally. And then lastly, over apologizing, the one that I'm working on is, is changing that to thank yous, if you do that. Um, so instead of saying, I'm sorry I kept you waiting, you know, thank you for waiting on me, I appreciate it. You know, thank you for your patience. And the research is actually uh, on apologizing is that it, sometimes people get annoyed with you if you over apologize. <laughs> So, so we want to, it is worth working on. Even if you think that that's a demonstration of caring, it also can turn out to be like annoying for the other person. So uh, I'm just going to do these next two so I can also share something with you that I have going on. So reframing is another technique you can use for yourself. Rather than making yourself feel badly, what would you tell your best friend? What would you tell a young child? What would you tell your pet if your pet could talk? <laughs> and, or what would they tell you? So I heard this thing, um, the woman was, was talking, the woman from this eating program that I do um, said, you know, your pet loves you. Your pet loves you and, and does not judge you in the way you judge you. <laughs> You know, think about you as the way your pet would look at you for a minute. You know, what would your pet tell you if the pet could talk, right? They'd be like, don't be so hard on yourself. You're awesome. <laughs> you know, I love you. You're great. You're the best person in the world. Come on, you know, <laughs> don't worry. You're my favorite. You know, um, you'd hear all sorts of things like that from your pet. Even young children can be very, you know, sincere and sweet and not even feel vulnerable in it, right? Very, very simply saying, um, I love you. Don't be sad. At least you tried, you know? <laughs> so think about it from a reframe point of view. And 10th way, slightly self-serving slide, but I truly believe in this or I wouldn't do this work is coaching and self-education and not totally self-serving because I don't care who you hire as a coach. Um, and I feel very blessed with my caseload and, and the folks who are working with me as it is. So I'm very happy with who is working with me. So it doesn't have to be me for me to be uh, satisfied with you getting coaching, okay? Um, but I do think that there's a benefit with coaching, I've, I've now gone from Steve to this woman, Dr. Sandella, um, who teaches me to do this interactive hypnosis technique, which is very extremely powerful. And I want to work with them on that too. But um, getting intentional about what you want to improve can really happen in a very profound way when you hire a coach. And it's important to find someone skillful and someone who you trust. I do want to say that. Um, it is an unregulated term. So you do want to look and make sure this person has experience and has, you know, the, a match is a match for you. Interview people, get to know them, get an experience with them before you hire them. But I, I really can't say enough about the coaching I've experienced. The first coach I ever had was through Jack Canfield's work. I had six coaches all at once to write my first book because um, we would rotate through the coaches and it was really awesome it was the best experience and then I, that just opened my mind to coaching and i started you know experiencing different coaches i've had buddy coaches i've had hired coaches <laughs> worked with people for short periods long per periods you know so in my own life i found a value in it and i definitely see the value for my clients uh, but getting super intentional about what you want to improve working with someone getting comfortable enough to reveal the stuff that stops you and so you can move through it and past it. You want someone encouraging who's there to bring out your best, someone who holds you in the space of possibility and who sees mm -hmm. the strengths in you. Um, if, they, if they can't see that, just like <laughs> switch. Um, I wanna mention that sometimes people are like, well, I have a mentor. And yeah, I've had all these things, mentors, accountability partners, mastermind groups. I still have an accountability partner. I have a mastermind group. Um, 
there's pros and cons to that. You know, there's the pros are like with a mentor, they'll give you advice with accountability partner. You can check in with mastermind group. You have the group force field, you know, working and serving you. Um, the cons of mentors are you can take what they say for granted. You're not, you aren't financially invested in that. So you <laughs> don't listen the same way. Um, accountability partners are just as good as your accountability partner is. If your accountability partner only checks in with you every three weeks, you know, you're going to get that. Um, you don't have the, you don't get to call the shots in the frequency of it. Mastermind groups are good, but you're sharing the space. Um, I think if you do group coaching, that's different because it's, it's designed to also give you that time for yourself as well, to have some individual sessions and things usually. So I've done them all. I think they all have value. And then self-education. So take a course and grow yourself. Those things really, truly do expand you. And as you, as you successfully expand, successfully survive risk, you will have a diminishment of some of these self-doubting statements, um, fears, unworthiness. You, you're just going to, that just, you're going to experience transformation, most likely, if you do the work, if you, if you find someone who, the skill and all of those. There's there's some ifs in there, of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I want to mention about. Um, let me see if I can do this. Uh, if I can move this. Yeah, I want to show you something I've been working on for a little under a year. Um, this is my COVID project, my goal, mm -hmm. and um, it was on my to do list and whatever. It's called um, the Anxiety Freedom Formula. If you experience anxiety. And it's an online course. And those who enroll are going to be called freedom takers because they're taking their freedom. They're not just waiting for it. And um, so it looks kind of like that. That's the beginning of it. And then when you go over to your course, there are six modules. And there's an example. So the modules have um, video lessons. Oh, actually, yeah, that will work. Okay. So let me actually back up because I'm still learning how to use this. Um, I want to show you the one with the tiles because it's cool. Yeah. So you can also, you can just click on the courses over there or you can scroll down and you can see the names of the modules. And it's just pretty, <laughs> but it also is packed with content. And I, what I've done is I've taken, I've been working for over two decades in my field and I've taken what I teach people who are experiencing the kind of things we're talking about today. Um, I take, I, I have taken everything I can think of and put them in this course in a step-by-step -step format to help you free yourself from anxiety if you experience that. And even if you don't experience it as a way of life, it, it, these particular techniques will help you if you're having moments of, you know, where you do, even if it's not like all day long, if you're having moments where you're really plagued by this and it stops you or you've been working on the same goal for a long time and you felt stuck, this stuff is like, honestly, it's what I do. And it's everything. And the reason I love what I'm doing on this course is because I there's no way I'm going to teach everything I know to one client. And so it allows me to now expand what I can share, what I can do to serve people. So, um, so it will look... When you go in, um, it has a, a little summary and it goes through the modules and teaches you stuff. And each module has um, videos and some of them are in the form of slides and some of them are, um, like this is, you know, whiteboard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I need to change the thumbnail on there. <laughs> Looks like I'm yelling, you will rest and digest. <laughs> anyway, um, we're still, you know, tweaking it a little. So that's why I'm going to offer a pre-launch price of it because, you know, I, this is like literally finished yesterday. Um, so I wanted to show it to you. If you're interested in that, what I'm going to get, stop this share. I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about that. Um, yeah. So here's, if you want a copy of, oh yeah, Anne, I love that. Hey, don't talk to my friend that way. Yeah, that's right. I have a friend that says that to me sometimes if I say something 
nasty about myself to myself. Um, yeah, but the stuff I'm teaching in that is all stuff that I use. I've learned through, I've applied it to myself. Like everything that I work on with my clients, I've done to myself. So I don't, I don't do anything I haven't tried because, because my first instinct on everything is this is hokey, <laughs> you know, but so it's the idea is to bring you from anxiety or panic or worry, or just walking around in stress or walking around in doubt or fear or low confidence to bring you where that is released and you are now replacing it with better things and you get to the other side, you know, where that's no longer a big part of your existence. It's just something that happens every now and then. And you know what to do when it happens, but it's just not your normal anymore. Um, so that's that's the intention and the work that is in that module and the, the, the modules in there, the six modules. The sixth module is almost like a full life coaching type of module. And so, yeah, so I'm going to be selling that course for $397 normally. And I'm going to, the pre-launch price is going to be $97 today. If you think you might want it, go ahead and, you know, message me on that. I'll, I'll put my email address too if you don't want to message me on Zoom. Shoot me a message if you want or text. Here's my cell. Oops. Yeah, and what I'm going to also offer is a bonus. And the bonus is going to be a coaching session with me to go along with this. So you're going to have a private coaching session and that is normally a $300 value. So in terms of the duration of what I'm planning to do with you in that session. So some of you have had coaching with me, you're it's, I know you may be paying me that rate, you know, for coaching. So this is a chance to get the online program and an extra hour of coaching. And that's free from the, from normally my coaching comes in packages um, of either six months to a year duration. And yeah, so that's an opportunity because you came today because you woke up early. I know you're a dedicated person and that's the type of person I like working with is dedicated. Yeah. Rolanda. Kim, is access lifetime or is it there a shelf life? It's a good question. Um, I don't want to say lifetime because I don't know how long I'm going to want to keep it active. So I'm going to give it um, for the $97, it'll be a six month shelf life. And yeah, and which will give you the, the course is designed to be completed and it's six modules, but you could do most of the modules have around six to eight lessons that are anywhere from five to nine minutes. So you could, you could actually complete the course in about eight weeks if you did like one lesson a day. Yeah. But you'd have the, you'd be able to repeat it and revisit the ones you like or are helpful for, for you. And whatever I add in, you'll have access to. Well, I guess so, this is a, a fair amount of time, particularly if you want to revisit and, and yeah. things happen and you might say, I might go to, and then if I'm working and it takes me out of the, the loop, but no, and I can always come back to it. Mm -hmm. it is um, comforting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. And, you know, I may end up leaving the course up indefinitely and I'm not going to go in and take people's names out. I just don't want to promise. Oh yeah. yeah. So I'd, I'd rather promise six months just in case there's a problem with the course and I need to take it down. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't foresee that. Yes, Lisa. So is it completely self-guiding? It's not something that with the exception of that one coaching session is um, self-guided? Yes, it's self-guided. It's not a replacement for therapy or coaching. Um, it's meant to serve as an educational device uh, to give you ideas. And um, if you, you know, if you need therapy or you need coaching, then I would encourage you to, to get that as well. But what my hope for this was, and I do say this at the beginning, my hope for it is that it, um, if you are in therapy or coaching, it's definitely a supplement to it that gives you the added edge that you need to just some additional stuff, additional support 
additional resources and um, you know, stuff that I literally do in clinical work and practice with therapy patients and stuff that I do as a life coach, since I'm a psychologist and a coach. Um, so it's different branches of my practice, but it's all stuff I do, stuff I use. So it's like in use. It's, this isn't this isn't just like stuff I've read could be helpful, you know. Um, so there's that. Yeah. So I'm wondering if somebody is working, if somebody wants to work with you in addition to follow the program uh -huh. about offering it also for my daughter, what that might look like. Yeah, okay. you can, um, if you want to, um, so are you asking if you wanted to get that for your daughter, but you wanted to have the session, is that what you're saying or, or vice versa? I was wondering, well, I guess because you, you have your uh, normal session rates. Yeah. And you might have something that would allow for the session rates to accompany that. Like if you could work in tandem with your own program for someone who's experiencing a lot of anxiety. Work in, I'm sorry. I'm not asking. I'm not understanding. What do you, what would you want? So, okay, so if someone's coaching with you, could they say in they're experiencing a lot of anxiety and they were on the module, uh -huh. could they work in tandem with you? So that you would say, okay, let's, yeah, totally. Yeah, it would, you could use it within your coaching. You could use it to supplement your coaching. Um, is your, that hard? Your, your coaching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I'm coaching yeah, someone coaching. and they wanted, they were working through the modules, they could say, hey, I'm doing these modules and I, you know, already got my, my session from you on the modules, but I, I want more coaching on this particular module, like you, this is a topic that I need more help on. Um, so like one of, for example, one of the videos is fear of hearing no and fear of saying no. Um, like if that was like a thing for you, then like if you were afraid of hearing no um, and you heard the video, that would give you ideas, but you were like, hey, I really need some more shifting on this. I know that I, I get very wound up over here. Um, you know, we could use, we could go in and do one of those interactive hypnosis sessions on you, um, within your coaching, for example, just, just as an example. So we can take it deeper. Um, we can also take it broader so we can look at other, other techniques within the same, like I might be teaching you these three top things that I use on this one problem in the video, but I might have 10 things I use. So we can also take it broader depending on what it is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. So any other questions or, um, what I'd love to hear from you kind of switching back to the, this, uh, experience today is if you got something out of this content, um, if you could just give me an indication so you can either uh, raise your hand or, or do a thumbs up or whatever if, if you felt like this was useful information for you, if you think you could use some of this. Okay. One, two, three. Oh, okay, good. I'm thankful that you got something out of this. That was my intention is that you could use some of this and apply it. And feel free, you know, if, if, as you re, if you want the slides and what have you, um, I'm happy to answer questions after this too. If something occurs to you, you know, shoot me an email or a text or whatever. I'm happy to, you know, answer any questions if you if you're chewing on this later today and you're like, oh, I wish I would have asked her about this. Um, feel free. Yes. Um, what's the deadline to get back to you if you're interested in signing up for the course? Um, well, to get it at the introductory price, it, it would be today. So let's. Midnight tonight. <laughs> Just curious, I didn't, you know, if there's. Yeah, a you all ask all the questions that I need you to ask me <laughs> because I didn't think about any of that. <laughs> Is it how long it's going to last? The deadline, all those basic stuff that I probably would could use an editor to help me think of. <laughs> so um, yeah, definitely, um, you have all day to ruminate on it. Um, but after tomorrow, please don't come to me and say, can I get the coaching session and the, 
online course for 97 because I put it at that price to inspire you to take action. So it will also inspire me to take action and um, fine tune and tweak. Like I need to add a quiz to module one, not a you know graded one, but a self quiz to make sure you understand it and stuff like that. So there's things I want to do to make it even stronger that I'm going to be adding to it once the real launch comes, but this, so pre-launch, you're going to, you're going to notice things coming in as a pre-launcher. Um, but as my appreciation for you, you get that lower rate. All right. Well, I'm so excited and grateful. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Anne, for saying you're grateful. I like how you do that with words. It's cool. You make me more aware of the language as well. Thank you. All right, you all, let's do a You Got This before we exit. And thank you again for coming. So Sarah, you got this. Thank and you. Lisa, you got this. Thank you, Sarah. That echo. Anne, you got this. Lisa. Anne, you got this. Had trouble unmuting for some reason. Thank you, Anne. Um, Becky, you got this. Thanks, Leanne. Kevin, you who were so incredibly brave to join us, you've got this. Thanks, Becky. Rolanda, you got this. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Lily, you got this. Thanks, Rolanda. I think that, um, Dr. Bam, you got this. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. And, and Ben and the baby, you got this. <laughs> they say thank you. <laughs> um, all righty. Well, thanks, thanks, you all. And I will look forward to seeing you at the next program. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.